from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Half Haunted by Gans T. Field I went into a house and it wasn't a house. A. A. Mill For six months, Judge Purvisan had intended to visit that old dwelling with a strange history, but Judge Purvisan often has trouble finding time to do what he wants most. The fall passed, the winter came, he spent Christmas not very joyfully helping the widow of a friend repossess some property at Salem. New Year's Eve found them at Harrisonville, where de Grandin and Talbridge wanted his word on translating certain old Dutch documents, better left untranslated. Heading west and south toward his home, he passed Scott's Meadows, and though it was nearly dark and snowing, he could not resist the opportunity to visit Criley's Mill then and there. A druggist on the little main street gave him direction. The judge drove up a steep, ill-paved road then between hills crowned with naked trees. Eventually he came to an old quarry road and followed it to here. Across a rapid brown brook, a creaky bridge led to the place. By the last rays of the sun, he decided he had either come the wrong way or come too late. He had heard of a tall, gaunt building, the ruins of a mill house, a place 200 years old that looked 2,000. This was almost the opposite, quite new, of brown shingles low and rambling with a screen porch and wide windows. The place should have been cheerful, but it was not. Purvisant drove across, got out, and knocked at the door. Snow began to shimmer down. Lights went on in the front room, and a man opened the door. He was small and slim, with a gray forelock and a lined shrewd face, reminiscent of the late Will Rogers. He wore a smoking jacket and slippers. Yes, he half challenged. Excuse me, replied Purvisan, hunching his massive shoulders. But is this Criley's Mill, the haunted house? Haunted? echoed the man on the threshold. Why, I. I don't know. There seemed to be only one thing to say. Purvisan shook snowflakes from his tawny mustache and said, I'm sorry to you have troubled you. I seem to have made a mistake. At once the other changed his manner. Oh, no, sir, no mistake. This was the place. You see, I built where Criley's mill was, just finished, and moved in on Thanksgiving. Look here, won't you come in? I'm sorry if I was abrupt. Just nerves. I didn't know who might be coming to my door, so far away from everything. His gaunt little hand caught up Purvisant's big one. Come in, sir. Or, wait, it's putting on to snow. I've got a double garage around back. Want to slide your car in with mine? Then we'll have a drink, maybe a bite to eat. He wanted Purvisant to stay. The judge gazed at him with big blue eyes, deceptively innocent. Then he nodded and said, Thanks, I'll be very glad to stay. After stowing the car, he returned through the snow. The little man still waited at the door to usher him in. What did you say your name was? The judge had not said, but he replied, Purvisant, Judge Keith Purvisant. I'm interested in haunted houses, and I'm Alvin Scrope, country editor, retired bachelor. They were in the front room now, a room designed to answer a man's prayer for comfort. It had cushioned furniture, thick rugs, bright pictures, plenty of light, a shelf of books. But as outside the cheer was somehow lacking, you'll have to pardon me, said Alvin Scrope. My houseboy left here, New Year's Eve, and I'm running the place alone for a day or so. From a side table, he lifted a bottle of scotch and a siphon. Mixing two highballs, he gave one to Purvisant. Snow's coming down harder. You'd better plan to stay the night. Purvisant laid aside overcoat and black hat. 
You're very kind, he said, wondering why he had been half rebuffed at first and almost wheeled into entering. Alvin Scrope dabbed at his forelock. Yes, sir, he said, trying to sound hearty. I built this right where the old mill stood. How do you like it? The judge fitted his big body into an armchair and sipped. I don't know yet. I've only come. How do you like it yourself, Mr. Scrope? Another dab at the forelock. To tell the truth, I don't know either. He too drank before continuing. Maybe because I've never had a place of my own before. And I've been used to working, always on the go with my paper. Now I'm a little lost with all the slack time on my hands. You know how that is. But when I first saw the spot, with the ruined mill and all, stuck away here, I thought it was as nice a building site as I'd ever heard of. I've been told a little about the mill and its legend, ventured Purvisant, rummaging in his pocket for a pipe. At once his hosts began the tales Purvisant had hoped. The place, I understand, was built before the War of Independence. It was owned and run by a man named Criley. He had a wife, a son, and a daughter. Mind if I take notes, asked Purvisant, producing notebook and pen. Go on, Mr. Scrope. Well, the war came. The miller and his son joined Washington's army. The British took New York, and there was a long, hard scrap to see whether they'd stop there or take the rest of the country, too. Purvisant nodded. He knew that dark, desperate phase of his nation's history. After that first disaster to American arms, the fighting had taken on the somber complexion of raids, ambuscades, betrayals. Considerable savagery on both sides. Nathan Hale and John Andre, two fine gentlemen, hanged like felons. Thousands of other tragedies. All the New York area, including this part of New Jersey, stuck full of grim deeds, giving rise to creepy tales. Scrope went on. New York had quite a few Hessian soldiers stationed around, hired to fight the Americans, you know. Again, Purvisant nodded. His Virginia ancestor had followed Washington in the Battle of Trenton. The Hessians weren't very fierce fighters, he commented. There was an exception to that rule, Scrope declared pithily. Still taking notes, Judge? I can't tell you this particular Hessian's name. But it comes down in the story how he looked. Big as you, I figure, Burley. He was a famous hunter back home in Germany. Maybe a criminal? Joining the army to escape? Anyway, he could beat the Americans at their own game of hunt and shoot. That's hard to believe, rejoined Purvisant. Some of Washington's men were hard-set old Indian fighters. This Hessian outdid the Indians. He'd strip naked even in winter and paint himself like a mohawk and sally out to kill. He was a dead shot and a devil with sword or hatchet or knife. Scrope paused to bite the end off a cigar. He could track or stalk anything, and he'd fight two soldiers at a time, sometimes more. He raided farms and murdered civilians, even women and children. Quite a score he ran up. Scribbling in his book, the judge could see in his mind one of those fancy portraits, so often vivid. A naked colossus, streaked with red and black, a heavy bone face, thick, pale brows over slitted eyes, a belt stuck full of weapons. Had the Hessian looked like that? Purvisant filled his pipe and thrust it under his mustache. Go on, he prompted. The two women left here at the mill hated and feared that Hessian. They plotted against him pretended to be British sympathizers, and scraped an acquaintance. That was nervy of them, commented the judge. His mind's eye showed him new pictures. Probably the daughter made the overture, buxom, rosy-cheeked on a chill afternoon. She managed to encounter the man of blood on a country lane. The Hessian would be a heavy-handed gallant. His broad, tough face grinned admiringly. The rural beauty trying not to tremble would venture a return smile a curtsy. They invited him to dinner, Scrope continued. He put on his best uniform. Strange that Hessian butcher would look in full dress, white small clothes and gaiters, modeling his brawny legs, the red coat with white facings and shiny buttons cramping his barrel torso. How out of place the powdered hair, the tall grenadier cap. 
but Scrope was getting on to the climax. When he sat down at the table, one of the women, mother or daughter, the story disagree, stuck a serving knife into his back. They got rid of the body somehow, walled it up or buried it in a cellar, but the spirit returned. How many sighed? demanded Pervisant. Many. The mother died of fright and the daughter jumping from an attic window before the year was out. The son committed suicide before he'd been long back from the war. Nobody says anything about the father. I guess he was killed in some battle. Well, that disposed of the family. The mill went out of use. There's lots of newer yarns. A girl from a Scots meadow yonder stayed one night ten years ago on a dare. Next morning she was roaming around, too crazy to talk. And you bought the place? Yes. Tore down the old mill house and rebuilt on its foundations. Shouldn't that lay any ghost, Judge Pervisant? Most rebuilders prefer to burn the haunted place entirely, said the judge. However, that depends on how much they believe in ghosts. I take it that you don't laugh at these stories. Scrope almost bit his cigar in two. Would you laugh, he asked, if two houseboys quit on you inside of six weeks? If something followed you all around your cellar? Something cold and sneaky that wasn't ever there when you turn around? If you fidgeted all the time, like at a play by Ibsen or a story by Poe? It's no laughing matter, Judge. Pervisant leaned forward. You imagine disturbing sights and sounds? Right. Never quite see or hear them, just a whisper, a shadow in dim places, when I'm all alone here. I wish, as Scrope grew somber, that I belong to some classical old church. A priest with bell, book, and candle would be mighty comforting. Just so, agreed Pervisant. It so happens that I know an old formula of exorcism. I'm not a clergyman, but I offer it for what it's worth, as charm or psychological clearance. Scrope frowned and smiled. The subject was new to him. Pervisant made haste to be logical. I'm not trying to make an occult convert out of you, Mr. Scrope, but it seems that a symbol or ceremony might serve as rationalization, a psychological peg to hang your worries on and forget them entirely. Right as a rabbit, cried Scrope, almost explosively. Go ahead, Judge. Do it. Pervisant set down glass and pipe and stood up. Scrope also rose from his chair. In so doing, he moved backward and stood almost by the darkened door that led to the rear of the house. Pervisant began solemnly. All ye evil spirits, I forbid you this man's bed, his couch. I forbid you in heaven's name, his house and home. I forbid you in the name of God, his blood and flesh, his body and soul, that all evil return from him and his unto you and yours in the name of the Trinity. He finished, and Scrope's face showed a sudden thankful relief, which went out like a light. Scrope's thin body suddenly gyrated, reeled. His mouth opened, shouting, Let go! Let go! He staggered backward to the door turned halfway and braced himself against the jam. He seemed to struggle with something beyond. Pervisant sprang toward him, and at that instant Scrope was walking shakily back toward the center of the room. His eyes were glassy, his lips slack, his face pale. Thought it had me, he panted. What? demanded Pervisant quickly, pouring whiskey. Didn't you see that big thing with a naked arm and no eyes? Drink this. I saw nothing. Scrope drank obediently. Color returned a little. He spoke rapidly as one who convinces himself of a hopeful fact. My imagination ran away with me, didn't it? Did it? Perisant filled Scrope's glass again. Plainly, Scrope was trying to save his nerves by chatter. Oh, it's quite clear, Judge. I've keyed up my imagination to what seems like reality. I was sure some sort of bogey and... But if you didn't see it, if I didn't see it, Pervisant took up Scrope's word, there is still no proof that it doesn't exist. Scrope looked blank and Pervisant continued, I take nothing for granted. This looks like the beginning of one of my adventures. But look here, Scrope suddenly went a little wild in his speech. You are reciting a spell against just that sort of thing. Why should it dare to tackle desperation to stave off defeat. Wait here. 
He went to the inner door and peered. There was a dim hallway to a kitchen, an open doorway for a bathroom to the left, and two closed doors to the right. He asked about them. Bedrooms, replied Scrope, steadying his voice. Want a light? No, thanks, Pervisant entered the hall. It was like stepping into a fog, into the vapor, for instance, of many damp, filthy coats in a sealed closet. Pervisant snorted and walked quickly through to the kitchen, turning on a light. Breathing was comfortable there, the sweat dried on his brow and his tawny mustache. All clear, Scrope was asking. So far, the judge gazed around the clean white kitchen with automatic refrigerator and electric range. It was the most reassuring room so far. He walked back into the hall, then into the rear bedroom. That's my room, Scrope informed him from the parlor door. Pervisant waited only a moment in the chamber, which filled the rear quarter opposite the kitchen, then into the hall yet again to glance to the bathroom. It was a fight to throw off the smothering, spiritual weight hanging in the dim atmosphere, finally to the closed door of the front bedroom. Who sleeps here? he asked, hand on knob. You will if you stay tonight, Scrope replied, and the judge entered. In the first instant he thought he had been struck. His knees wavered, his brain swam and darkened. The walls, weren't they ruinous, flaking away, whirled around him in the gloom, but he kept his feet and his head groped for the light, switched, turned it. He had been wrong. The room was quite modern, cream-papered, and should be bright, but the light was as murky as though it shone through smoke. A neat single bed, a bureau, an armchair. Now, could that arrangement cause such a deep shadow in the far corner, or was it a shadow? The weight he had felt in the hall was doubled here, crushing him as a diver's crushed by sea-bottom pressures. The switch clicked, though Pervisant had not touched it. The light went out abruptly. Something pawed at him through the darkness, a hand. He saw it dimly, but not its arm. Was there an arm? Pervisant jerked away, but refused to retreat. Now a face hung in the thick dusk, a head anyway, for he made out the contour, not only not the features, but it must have a mouth, for he felt the fanning of tepid breath, heard a mumble that became a word of sorts. Rouse, German, get out. Pervisant stared at the hanging oval, trying to find eyes to fix with his own. Now another touch at his shoulder. Light this time, fluffy, another voice so soft as to be felt rather than heard. No, stay. You came to save. The featureless head became more solid, and a suggestion of body was visible beneath thick as big as Pervisant's own body. Wide planted columns that might be misshouldered legs. Again, rouse. Pervisant back from the room, leaving the door open. He was in the parlor again, wiping his face. He felt better. Scrope, mixing more drinks, looked at him questioningly. You felt it too, huh? I felt something. For a moment, I saw. The judge paused to marshal his thoughts. Who has ever slept in that front bedroom? Nobody. The houseboy, before he left, had a lean-to off the kitchen. You're inaugurating my guest room tonight, judge. Here, have a drink. They touched glasses and drank. Then they crossed the heavy aired hall to the kitchen. Scrope quickly cooked a meal. Simple but hearty, hams, eggs, home fried potatoes, strong coffee. They ate at a white top table. Pervisant acted as though fear had not come to him that night. I suggested that the Hessians weren't good fighters, he observed, holding out his cup. But they were Germanic, and Germany has been the home of witches and devils. Read Faust. Read Phantasmagoria. Read The Brothers Grimm. And in a file of old New York, out of print now, I found a story of how two Hessian soldiers bewitched a Manhattan farmer. True story? It's in the reminiscences of George Rappajay. That's a respected name in old New York history. Rappajay claimed to have seen it happen. Yes, and other Hessians. Settling in Pennsylvania and New Jersey worked magic. Of course, look at that headless horseman yarn of Irving's contributed scrope. Judge, you've got something. 
If that spell you recited, I wish you hadn't, for it didn't work. Purvisant looked earnestly at Scrope. I didn't finish. It must be said three times, an hour apart. He drew out a thick gold watch, and an hour has passed, or nearly. Quite steadily, if not casually, he walked into the hall. Scrope came out behind. Again Purvisant felt the baleful weight and closeness. Undaunted, he began to recite for the second time. All ye evil spirits, I forbid you this man's bed, his couch. I forbid you, in heaven's name, his house and home. I forbid. It had come heavily, noiselessly, out of the front bedroom, a hunched back hulk of it that straightened and showed itself as tall and powerful as Purvisant. The judge knew amazement, complete but rational. Even in the half light, he made out only a silhouette roughly human, vague at the edges, clothed or naked, he could not say, as before a faceless head lifted itself on broad shoulders. Only the fingers of the hand were distinct. They spread, advanced. Thus his eyes summed up, while he kept reciting the exorcism down to its end. All evil return from him and his unto you and yours in the name of the Trinity. It blundered forward, clutching, the doorway was no place to fight in, not even if the foe was normal. Purvisant retreated quickly and lightly, for all his bear-like weight. Behind him, Scrope had run whimpering to the back door, tried to tear it open without unlocking. Come on, Scrope was crying. We'll get out of here. Wait, called Purvisant in reply. Look, and Scrope paused and turned back. The thing's gone, said Purvisant. It vanished before my eyes as I retreated. He clasped his big hands behind his back. Something was wrong here, absolutely unconventional, for there is a certain unconventionality about demons and their ways. How often did the old book say that the best way to quell a specter is to face it dauntlessly? Yet here was the exact reverse. The foe had faded only when he and Scrope fled. He glared at the empty hall, as though to read there an answer to the enigma. But the hall was not empty, and it was another pale suggestion, of shape slender this time, and the softer voice he had sensed in the bedroom. Again, again, it too vanished. Scrope drew alongside of Purvisant, peering. Judge, were you and I seeing things, both of us? Purvisant actually grinned and shook his tawny head. No chance of that, Scrope. People who see things don't see the same thing at the same time. Group hypnotism began Scrope, as though the word might be a comfort, but again Purvisant gestured a demur. I believe in many strange things, Scrope, but not in that. Don't go back into the hall. Sit here in the kitchen. I begin to understand, to guess at least. They sought their chairs, Purvisant faced the door. The old familiar situation, worn threadbare by writers of fantasy, he pronounced. The murdered one haunts the place of his destruction. He stared hard into the hallway, wondering if he had really seen a stir of movement there. Anyway, it's here, spiteful and harmful, able to attack. That's right, nodded Scrope, sighing. He appeared to me, then you, then to both of us. Which brings us to point number two. The spell is going to work. Scrope glanced up in almost prayerful eagerness. You're sure? Not quite sure of anything in life or death, but this thing's desperate. It's trying to fight us. I gather from what you told me that it never manifested itself so strongly before. Scrope was nodding eagerly. Sure, it's been around here a sort of edgy atmosphere that drove my houseboys away, but nothing like this. As you say, it's playing the game for keeps now. It's in danger, replied Purvisant. His blue eyes remained fixed in the hallway. So are we, but it's alone in its fight, and we have friends. Friends? echoed Scrope. I saw another shape, or near shape, twice. It doesn't threaten, it pleads. It wants us to go ahead and win. Scrope gazed at Purvisant. I think I saw it too, but if it's a ghost... Don't you realize that a ghost might want release? And other besides the Hessians found the tragic death here? Two women, didn't you say? I heard a voice ask for the final repetition of my spell. 
again, it said. Well, began Scrope uncertainly. The spirits of those two women are here too, said Purvisant confidently. The evil of the place is too strong to let them escape, even though they're dead. Judge, gasped Scrope very pale. He swallowed twice and continued. You realize something? If something happens to us... Exactly, agreed Purvisant very steadily. We'd be caught too. For all eternity, I realize it perfectly. That is why we must push this thing through to the end and wind. He rose again and went to the door. Foot on the sill, he leaned ever so narrowly in. Then he drew quickly back, like a spectator from the cage of an angry beast. Still here, he reported, ready for us. It too knows that the showdown's at hand. Scrope studied the doorway, eyes and lips hard. I've got a theory. It stays in that part of the house, the middle part. Might it live in a cellar? Why? asked Judge Purvisant. Because the cellar, the old basement, lies only under the bathroom and the hall and that guest bedroom, with only a bit lapping under parts of the kitchen and... By thunder you have it, interrupted Purvisant excitedly. While Scrope stared, the judge fished his pen from his vest pocket. He began to sketch on the tabletop. See here, he lectured as he drew. Your house is sprawling. Great. Big rooms making a wide base like this. He outlined the square, and the cellar is rather centrally located, so... He marked in a smaller rectangle, which took a middle slice of the square. Yes, that's about like it, nodded Scrope. What are you getting at? Don't you see, man, cried Purvisant, almost roughly. That basement shows the limits of the old house, narrow and high, just as this new one is broad and low. The spirit haunted the old place. Your house takes in that original territory, and some new ground as well. He threw down the pen. You're only half-haunted, Scrope. Understanding dawn onto the little man's face, he sprang to his feet. He began a glad jabber. That changes everything. We're safe. If we don't go in there. Oh, but we're going in there. Scrope looked wide-eyed scared. Purvisant elaborated. The last recital of the spell would take place right in the thing's den. Right on his own dunghill, so to speak. We'll destroy him forever where he can't seek refuge from us. Again, an hour was passed. The two rose from their chairs in the kitchen. It's time, said Scrope, looking at his wristwatch. Judge, must I come in there with you? You must, Purvisant assured him. Into that front bedroom, the creature must face his final exorcism. He walked to the hall, and in, Scrope kept close behind, on feet that sounded amazingly heavy for so small a body. They stood together in the hall's dimness. It was no longer the hall, new and narrow and fresh painted in light color. It was a corner of something else. Despite the gloom, Purvisant could see plainly that the waltz had somehow fallen away. He stood as in a wide and ruinous apartment, with shattered windows extended almost to the high ceiling. The half-rotted floorboards were strewn with rubbish like plaster fallen away from ancient laths. Wind? There was surely wind here, in the very center of Scrope's snug home. Yes, wind blowing through the cracks in the big wrecked place to which they had somehow been wafted. Judge, breathed Scrope, I know. This is the old mill. It looked like this before they tore it down. Quiet, bade Purvisant. He moved in the direction where he remembered the front bedroom door to be. It was before him now. He felt its knob under his hand, though he could not see it. Hinges creaked. They could walk further into that room that had been part of the raised mill. Again, things were changed to their eyes. A sort of blue-green light, such as filters down to the bottom of deep water, showed them spacious floor, high ceiling, great windows, but no more in ruins. The room was suddenly fresh, solidly built, a room for living. Painted plaster, broad white sills and jams, some furry pelts spread like rugs and furniture. Even in the weird soft glimmer, Purvisant knew the valuable antiques when he saw them. Yonder table was such dark stock gleaming, the chairs too. The table was spread with white linen, set with silver and china. 
and somebody, something was seated there as if to eat. The Hessian, of course, or what had been the Hessian. It faced them across the table. Now Pervisant knew where the watery glow came from. That semi-shape exuded it, like touchwood. He could dimly make out a clarification of outline and detail. A dress coat of ancient British style, powdered hair, elegant, strangely out of place upon such a brute body. The most light came from around the head, which still did not have a face. Pervisant began to recite once more. All ye evil spirits, I forbid you this man's bed, his couch. The blue light dimmed. The shape rose and came toward them. Scrope, muttered Pervisant between phrases of his formula. Lights, turn them on. He put himself where the approaching shape would find him. I forbid you in heaven's name, he continued. Strong hands seized him, hands as cold as marsh ice. He had a sense of filth and ferocity being hurled at him. He fought back. Judge Keith Pervisant was big, strong, and cunning, but he was his match. It worked those cold hands to his throat, striving to shut off his breath and the words he spoke. He heard it panting and snarling like the unknown animals of which one dreams. His own fist struck towards that featureless face, battering it backward upon its cloudy shoulders, but the thing wrestled closer and closer, trying to throttle him. The lights won't work, Scrope was screaming. He struck a match, set it to a scrap of paper he whisked it out of his pocket. This little torch he held aloft. The rosy light dominated the blue and scroped saw plainly the thing that Pervisant grappled. He screamed louder and dropped the blazing paper. It floated sideways into some sort of wall hanging. A strong flame leaped up. Pervisant caught the hard chill wrist of his enemy and tore himself free. Unto you and yours, in the name of the Trinity, he finished. Then he wheeled abruptly, seized and lifted Scrope, and hurried him away. They found themselves in the parlor, the room they had known before. Behind them, flames gushed and roared like a blast furnace. Scrope, set on his feet again, seemed ready to faint. Pervisant shook sense and steadiness back into him. Come on, he ordered. Keep moving, outside. This place is burning like a wicker basket. They reached the outside, and Pervisant let Alvin Scrope lean against a tree for support. He himself hurried to the double garage. He started and brought out first one, then the other of the cars, parking them at a point safe from any flying sparks or embers. He returned to his companion. The flames now burst open from the open parlor windows, licking at the clapboards and shingles outside. Snow fell but scantily, barely enough to make a hissing in the heat. Scrope shook himself like a dog coming out of water. He was getting command over his fear-crumbling spirit. How do we better get to a phone somewhere, he suggested. There's a volunteer fire department in town. No, said Pervisant. No fire departments. Let that house burn to the ground. To the ground? Scrope's face looked strong in the red light. Yes, of course. You're exactly right. No more ghosts after fire. I can build again. Build and be at peace. Let it burn, I say. We'll drive the cars to Scott's Meadows and stay at the little inn there. And tomorrow you can come and stay with me at my home until you catch hold of your fares again. Thanks, I will. They fell silent in the darkness, no longer so chilly. Came a rustle of passing, a semi-shape. Two semi-shapes glided swiftly by like puffs of smoke from the house. Thank you, Pervisant felt gentle cries of joy, more in his heart than his ears. Thank you. They were gone. Scrope, too, had been aware of that passing. I guess he ventured that the spirits of those poor women are set free. From the heart of the red rage of flame that now possessed all the house came suddenly a sound, a shout, a roar, a scream, recognizable as human and masculine. Scrope faltered and swore. That? Was the Hessian? It is what was the Hessian, agreed Pervisant, gazing at the fire. Another peal of sound full of horror, full of agony. Why does he stay, quavered Scrope. Those others thanked us for setting them free. Why does he hang on there until he's burned clear, loose from? He broke off. I know, he said, gaining command of himself again. Pervisant turned toward him. 
What then? The women were killers, yes, but they killed for a good purpose. They knew they'd find some kind of happiness now, that they're not held here, but... And Scrope too face a fire. The other thing has nothing like that to expect. He hangs onto the burning den. Because when he leaves, it'll be for... For... Something much worse finished Ferguson for him. Once again, the suffering voice mounted up and shook the night. Then it died to a wail, a rattle. It died to nothing. It was silent. The flames flapped like banners of victory. They seemed cleaner and more joyous. Pervisant and Scrope suddenly shook hands.